In this video, let's check out the best insanely rare weapons and armor sets in the game. Some long-time viewers will probably recognize a few of the items on this list, as this is a series that I have brought you previously. However, it's now updated and it's bigger and better than ever. And as you can see from the length of the video, I've meticulously blended this entire series into one easily digestible video. So grab some snacks and a notepad, and let's get geared up and prepare for the DLC with some of the most powerful and rarest equipment in the game. This is one of the most coveted armor sets in the game, at least for me personally, because I adore the Redmayne Knights. I think they look incredibly awesome, and damn is this set hard to farm. So meet me here now at the impassable Great Bridge site of Grace, and we are going to run northwest past all of these soldiers and dogs having a fight. And toward the edge of the cliff, you will find the Redmayne Knight that we're going to farm. There are actually three farmable Redmain Knights in Castle Redmain itself, but they're very spread out and none of them are anywhere near a site of grace. The reason I have advised to farm this guy will become apparent in just a second. Once he is dead, jump off the cliff and kill yourself. Once you die, opt to resurrect at the stake of Marika, and it will put you on a cliff just above his spawn location. Now you can jump straight back down, kill him again, rinse and repeat. Killing him and respawning three times is much, much quicker than trying to farm all three of the knights in Castle Redmain, which is why it is preferable to do it this way. Also, obviously, make sure you're doing things like wearing the silver scarab talisman and using the silver pickled foul foot. If you need more, usually the ingredient that you're lacking for this is the four-toed foul foot. And another great reason for farming this knight is because there is a load of penguins around that will drop that item. Yes, I know that's not their actual name. <laughs> I know what it is. I can't pronounce it. I'm not even going to attempt it. But it is on the screen for you now, so you know what critter I'm talking about. Okay, enough rambling about the red main armor set. Let's move on to the second item, the black dumpling. The best place to farm this one is going to be at the guest hall gray site in the Volcano Manor. This headpiece is horrific, truly. Just listen to the text. A mask forced on a victim's head to lend torture an extra degree of cruelty. It magnifies one's fears and makes them acutely aware of all forms of pain. When the black dumpling goes on, the torturer no longer seeks answers, only to inflict suffering without hope of relief. Also, as it says, it raises your attack power when you suffer from madness, which is a very weird, very unique effect. So this can be paired with something like the Unendurable Frenzy as a way to intentionally trigger it on yourself to get that 10% damage boost that you get for wearing this headpiece. As for farming it, literally head out into the next room and you will see one of the first generation Albanorix wearing it. Now head south into the previous room, there will be four more in here and another one that runs down the stairs at you for a total of six that you can farm in very quick succession. Then you just want to run back or teleport back to the guest hall grey site and do it again. Rinse and repeat until you have the black dumpling. As there is six of them to farm, despite the fact that this may be the rarest one on the list, it shouldn't take too long because there are six nice and close and they die very, very quickly. Now we shall move on to number three, the blue silver set. I shall now meet you at Ordina in the Consecrated Snowfields as we take a look at the blue silver set. This is worn by the wolf riding Albanoric archers and is probably one of my favorite armor sets in the game. It's incredibly awesome and unique and my god is it hard to farm. Personally, what I recommend is killing Latena when you first meet her at the slumbering wolf's shack. You lock yourself out of a somber ancient dragon smithing stone, but she drops this whole set right at the start of the game, and you remove the need for this agonizing farm. Should you wish to keep her alive and do the farm, from the Ordina Grey site, head southwest and there will be a few wolves and three archers all stood around these cliffs. They are lethal and will all back each other up. As soon as you shoot one, they'll all start shooting. So it is not an easy farm. So the alternative is to fight the archers actually in the town itself, but that's arguably no easier. No matter which way you look at it, farming these archers is tough because they are crazy strong in terms of damage and defense. 
yeah, there's no easy way to put this. If you want to do this farm, good luck. It's going to be painful, but the reward is so worth it. This set is awesome. So now that we've done that, we will talk about a very specific chest piece. The Guardian Armor in full bloom. Quick public service announcement for you. This chest piece is missable. As you see, I'm in the Minor Erd Tree Church, where we farmed the rest of the Guardian set and the Sword Spear. However, please be advised, despite the fact that all the Guardians here are very clearly wearing this armor, they do not drop it. You can only get this armor from the Guardians with the large flowers near the Erd Tree Sanctuary site of Grace in the Royal Capital before it becomes the Ashen Capital. So if you want this, you need to farm it before you change the world state. It has a very cool effect that it raises the HP recovery effects of your Flask of Tears, but greatly lowers your fire damage negation. And this bit of flavor text is very cool. It is said that the blood red flowers blooming on their backs mark the senescence of their ancient pact. Perhaps the guardians are part tree already. I genuinely think the Guardians may have become my favorite NPCs in the whole game. I love everything about them. I love their look. I love their lore. I love their weapon, clearly. I cannot stop banging on about the Guardian Sword Spear. So as I can't stop banging on about how good it is, let's talk about the first weapon on our list, which is, of course, the Guardian Sword Spear. When it comes to this weapon, the best place to farm it is going to be the Minor Earth Tree Church at the south of the Lanedale Capital outskirts. There are six guardians here around the church. Most of them are hiding in the floor though. So have a look for what look like bunches of red flowers sticking out of the ground. And hopefully after a few resets with high enough discovery, you'll be able to grab yourself the guardian's sword spear. Now this weapon is incredibly slept on and needs quite a lot of explanation to stress exactly how amazing this is. Firstly, again, it has the spinning slash, but you can infuse it with any ash of war and get rid of that. More importantly, this weapon has insanely high scaling with dexterity, especially if you apply the keen affinity to it. So much so that a plus 25 keen sword spear actually has a higher attack rating at both 99 strength and 99 dex than a quality short spear at 99 strength and 99 dex. If you want a bloody powerful dex weapon, this is the one you want to use. It also has a unique moveset compared to most other halberds, shared only with Loretta's War Sickle. Honestly, this is probably the most slept on weapon in the game. I've done a separate build guide based around this weapon because it is so powerful, so make sure you go and check that out as well. And now onto the next set, the High Page set. Not to be mistaken, with the Page set, this one is far rarer as there are not many high pages around. It does not have any gloves and it shares the page trousers with the regular page set. So you're actually only farming for the hood and the clothes. This is best farmed in Landell Royal Capital as there are a few around there. And the quickest one to farm would be from the West Capital Rampart site of Grace. Run out towards the Gargoyle and the Golden Seed then double back on yourself, head down the stairs, and there is a page on your left-hand side. It's a short run and you won't aggro any enemies, so you can just quickly keep farming that one. However, if you've already gone past the Royal Capital, you now find me in the Rea Lucaria Academy, and to easily get to this one, once you have unlocked the shortcut ladder, from the Church of the Cuckoo site of Grace, enter the church, Take the ladder up, and on the other side of the room is a long hallway where you'll find this high page at the end. It is still quite an aggravating grind because of the fact that they are so limited, and it is a bit of a trek to get back every single time you need to refarm. Also, it can be altered to remove the cape, but let's be honest, armor sets always look so much better with capes, so leave it on. Now we're going to take a look at the Mausoleum Soldier set and the Mausoleum Knight set. We'll start off with the Mausoleum Soldier set, and the easiest place to grind for this one is at the East Gate Bridge Trestle, here in Northern Lyonia. Now head east towards the Wandering Mausoleum and just kill all of the Mausoleum Soldiers around here. There's also a Mausoleum Knight that you can farm for the Knight set, but hold that thought, there is an easier one, and I'll come onto that once we've finished talking about the Soldier set. 
it's a good job there are so many mausoleum soldiers here because the drop rate is abysmal it took me hours and throughout this total clear you can see i didn't get even one piece of their armor set so if you do want this one good luck because you'll probably need it now that i've shown you where to farm for this one we will move on to the mausoleum knights and actually the best place to farm for this one is way to the northeast in the black knife catacombs as soon as you load in here head back outside and a mausoleum knight is right in front of you with the right weapon and enough damage one backstab will kill them so though the grind for this one is quite slow it's very painless because the sight of grace is right there and you can usually kill this mausoleum knight before it even aggros also, the flavour text of the armour is heartbreakingly awesome. The winged shape ornaments on its back evoke the Death Bird, a self-inflicted curse that ties the spirits of these loyal knights to the land, having willingly beheaded themselves so that they may serve their masters in death. That is truly haunting. And again, make sure with all of these farms that your discovery is way higher than mine currently is. Bump up that arcane skill, use the silver scarab, use the silver pickled foul feet, or this will take you an eternity. The next one we'll be reviewing is the marionette soldier bird helm. A metal helm formed in the likeness of the face of a bird, worn by the avionette soldiers crafted to serve the sorcerers. The construction of this helm is remarkably crude, for a doll, the only thing that matters is that it does not break. I'm not going to lie, I think it looks pretty damn dumb. But for all of us completionists out there, we must have it. So now let me show you the easiest way to farm it. Meet me at the Southern Aeonia Swamp Bank in Kaled. Of course, we've come here for a reason, and that's because there are three nearby avionettes that you can kill without needing to aggro any other enemies. Straight away, head northwest, and you can aggro one of them right here. As soon as you've taken out that one head back to the gray site and now you want to go southwest and there are two more in this area that you can farm as well just grind them and you will probably have this one in no time at all next is the octopus head this has got about a 0.5 percent chance to drop from any of the little baby land octopuses not to be confused with the giant land octopuses for the longest time i actually thought this did drop from the giant ones and it was only when this dropped for me during my most recent playthrough that I realised. It's not quite as hard to farm as a few others on this list due to the fact there are so many of them. In fact, loads of them can be found just south of the Saints Bridge site of Grace in a small lake right by where you first meet Iron Fist Alexander. There's a few other locations with lots of them, but honestly, I'd say that's probably the easiest place to farm it. And just one other quick thing about the octopus head before we move into the second piece. For its weight, it actually has surprisingly solid resistances. And as the item description states, those who can withstand the smell will find its organic elasticity excellent for negating strikes. And exactly as it says, its strike resistance is insane, especially for how light it is. So this is actually a really solid mid-weight helm, albeit it looks creepy AF and has its own jiggle physics. Moving on, and we're actually going to be looking at both the Nox Monk and the Nox Swordstress sets. Both of these sets share the same braces and greaves, and they actually also share their braces and greaves with the Night Maiden set, which we'll come onto in just a minute. So you should find that by the time you finish your farm, you will have an endless amount of braces and greaves, and it's just the helms and the chest pieces that you will be farming for. So firstly, we'll take a look at the Nox Monk set. This is definitely the most visually different of the three, though definitely not my favourite. The helm can be altered to remove the hood, and the armour can be altered to remove the cape. And the best place to farm this set is right here in Noxstella, the Eternal City. From the Noxtella site of Grace, basically just clear all the Nox enemies in the immediate vicinity. You'll find plenty of monks and swordstresses around here. For the monks, two can be found in the ruins northwest of the Noxtella site of Grace, and two more can be found in the room locked behind a stone sword key to your left after going up the stairs. All of the armor we'll be collecting from these next few enemies has a 3% drop chance, so in theory it isn't as tedious as the octopus helm, However, as you actually have to fight these enemies, and there are far fewer of them, 
this could certainly take a lot longer to obtain. And moving on to the Nox Swordstress set, other than the four monks I previously mentioned, the rest of the enemies in this area are Swordstresses, aside from one Night Maiden up the stairs. As the text on this armor states, these women are the personal guards of the Night Maidens, and the silk hides their eyes. However, you can alter the crown and remove the silk eye covering, launching convention. Now that we've covered the personal guards of the Night Maidens, let's move on to the armor set of the Night Maidens themselves. The Night Maiden set is definitely the hardest to obtain of the three, and rightly so because it indicates the highest clerical rank. The best place to farm for this set is at the Knight's Sacred Ground. Specifically, once you have completed the area and opened all shortcuts, you can go to the Knight's Sacred Ground Site of Grace at the end of the zone and trace your steps back up the stairs, back into the church with the large sphere silver tier, and there are two Knight Maiden enemies that you can farm in here. It's a little bit more of a walk than the other Nox enemies, and there are only the two of them, which is why this one will take the longest to farm. This one is also the most impressive though, in my opinion, with the twin crown headpiece that the Night Maidens wear. And now that we've covered all three armor sets of these Nox enemies, let's take a look at the Black Flame Monk set. This set is tremendously more rare and harder to find and farm than the standard Flame Monk set, owing to the fact that all four pieces drop off only two specific enemies in the game. You can find one at the bottom of the Divine Tower of Kaelid, but my personal choice is here in the Volcano Manor. From the Temple of Eagle Sire of Grace, where you defeated the Godskin Noble, head back outside the way you came in, turn left and walk down the stairs, and you'll see a Black Flame Monk at the bottom that you can sneak up and backstab. Personally, the Black Flame Monk set is so much more awesome than the standard Flame Monk set because it's just so much more intimidating due to the complete absence of colour in this set. And when you read the text and understand the Black Flame Monks, you understand how much more intimidating they are. The Black Flame Monks, enthralled by the god-slaying Black Flame, became traitors, abandoning their posts as guardians. The seduction of a taboo is never easily spurned. This is definitely one of the longest grinds, but if you are a completionist like me and you do love your fashion souls, definitely a set worth grinding. Very, very cool. Now we'll take a look at both versions of the Banished Knight sets. I will be covering both the altered and unaltered versions of this set at the same time, because they are individual pieces, you cannot just alter them with Bok or with your tailoring tools, and the different pieces drop from different enemies. It's not quite as straightforward as you'd imagine, so bear with me and let's go through it together. We'll start off with the normal version of the Banished Knight Helm and the altered version of the armor. And that is because the Banished Knight Helm only drops from one location in the game, and that is at the Cathedral of the Dragon Communion in Kaelid. You'll see one wandering around as soon as you spawn in, and another one standing by the cliff to the west. Farming these two is the only way to get this headpiece, and as you're farming them, they also have a chance to drop the Banished Knight armor altered. I'm not even going to bother talking about the gauntlets or the greaves because they all drop the same gauntlets and greaves. So by the time you have finished farming both versions of the helm and both versions of the armor, you will have the greaves and the gauntlets. I'd be incredibly surprised if you didn't. Now, the Banished Knight armor altered can also drop off the Banished Knight in Stormvale Castle in the room with the human limbs hanging from the roof. As you're farming for them too, you can also try and grab yourself the altered version of the Banished Knight helm. This can only drop from one Banished Knight, and he is again in Stormvale Castle, located next to the chapel in the northwest section where Sorcerer Regere is. So once you find him, head back outside again and you will see the Banished Knight wielding this helm. Finally, I saved the best till last. Best because it definitely looks the best, I love a cape. But also, I was being a little bit sarcastic because this is painfully agonizing to farm. The unaltered version of the Banished Knight armor can only be farmed in Castle Sol. There are two here, one to the south and one to the north. I'll be focusing on the northern one because he is way easier to farm in my opinion. Starting from the Castle Sol rooftop grace site, run south to the elevator. Call it up to you so that you can get a better vantage point, but make sure you don't accidentally send it down because you can mess this up. 
Now you'll see the Banished Knight over there in the distance. Shoot him with a ranged weapon and it will cause him to teleport towards you. Now you can kill him and when he inevitably doesn't drop it, teleport back to that site of grace and rinse and repeat until he does. Also, I should say far, far, far later on in the game at the crumbling Pharaoh Missoula is a load more Banished Knights. However, just like the ones at the Cathedral of Dragon Communion, I believe they all drop the altered armor and unaltered helm. Because of the fact that all of the different knights drop different pieces and this cannot be altered by you or Bok, it makes this a painstaking farm. So if you do try and do it, good luck. The unaltered version of the armor looks amazing, but it is a painful farm. Now that you know where to get them, we will move on to the second last armor set, and that is the Fire Prelate set. Just really quickly, I'll show you the altered version of the armor, which isn't adorned with the red cloth. That altered version is dropped by the Fire Prelate found in Fort Lithe in Mount Gelmir. We won't be focusing on that though, because it just doesn't look as good as with the red tabard. So the full set with the red tabard, the best place to farm it is at the Guardian's Garrison in the mountain tops of the Giants. Just by this site of grace, head towards the Garrison and on the left you will find a Fire Prelate. Once again, all of the drop rates are abysmal and this is one of the toughest enemies in the game just because they're so damn tanky. So this is definitely a painful one to farm and personally it's not my favourite. But it is a very rare, very sought after armour and it would have felt wrong to not include it in this list. So there it is, this is the Fire Prelate set, and that, in my opinion, is the best place to farm it. And whilst we're already in the area for the Fire Prelate set, you can also farm this enemy here in the mountaintops to get your hands on the Thorned Whip. This weapon does have the highest percentage drop chance of any of the weapons on this list, but it literally only drops from this one enemy in the game. So it really can be quite a grind for it to drop, because this Fire Prelate is also very powerful. And as it says, this hefty whip is covered in crimson thorns. It is the weapon of the prelates who lead the fire monks and is a device of fearsome religious encouragement fashioned in the image of the Briars of Sin. Now there is unfortunately not really anything very awesome to shout about when it comes to this whip. Yeah, okay, it's very effective at inflicting blood loss as it says, but really the reason you're farming for this is purely just for bragging rights to say you have it. I will leave in the fight of me versus the guy who wields it because the moveset he uses is amazing. I'm so jealous when fighting him. And yeah, I'm super jealous that we don't get any special moveset like the Fire Prelate does. It is quite customizable as you can change the Ashes of War. It starts off with Kick, which is a very niche but very powerful Ash of War in the right situation. And finally, though not farmable, still very, very missable, we have Dialos's Mask. This is the alternative headpiece for the Knight of Blood's armor set that you get for defeating Juno Hoslo during the Volcano Manor assassinations, though this version of the headpiece is obtained very differently by completing Dialos's questline. I think it's probably one of the longest, most complex, missable questlines in the game, and about the only NPC I haven't specifically covered and given his own video yet. I'm sure many other people have already done that for me, so if you do want this mask, you can go and check out a full guide. I personally don't rate it that highly. I feel like Hoslo's helm looks so much cooler, and wearing this is just kind of bragging rights. You can actually get this really early on by just straight up killing Dialos in the north of Lyurnia of the Lakes when you meet him quite early on in his questline. But yeah, there it is, the replica of the twin-tailed silver helm with flowery adornments, only without the twin tails. Nowhere near as badass as the original helm, but still very cool to own. That's all of the armor sets covered, and obviously we've touched on a couple of the weapons, so now let's move into the second half of the video and look at the remaining rarest weapons in Elden Ring. So let's get straight into it as we start off right here in the Dominula Windmill Village. 
There are actually three ultra rare weapons here with a 0.5% chance to drop. I will show you two of the three being the Celebrant's Rip Break and the Celebrant's Cleaver. The final one is the Celebrant's Sickle. All three of them do basically the same thing. Once you've seen one, you've seen them all. None of them have any particularly nifty movesets or awesome Ashes of War. However, they are all upgraded with regular smithing stones and can be infused and buffed as you see fit. So they're very, very versatile. And the awesome feature about all three of these weapons is, as you can see here, every single time you hit an enemy, you gain 10 runes. 10 runes doesn't sound like much, but you do a lot of hitting in this game. So if you somehow luckily manage to farm one of these pretty early on in your playthrough and level it up, then you've got yourself a fairly tasty way of just passively gaining way more runes than usual, especially if you dual wield and power stance the cleavers, because dual wielding and power stancing axes in this game, they have a pretty awesome moveset. Also, the festival dancers at the village are very easy to kill. So even though the drop chance is very low, farm itself is quite painless. Now we'll move on to two of my favourites. I know I should do that stereotypical YouTuber thing of making you wait to the end to see the really juicy ones, but I'm just too nice and too excited to show them off to you. So here is two of my favourites, the Clean Rot Spear and the Halo Scythe. We'll start off with one of my personal favourites, the Halo Scythe which will drop from any of the lesser clean rot knights wielding the halo scythe here in the aeonian swamp in Kaled, and that is all of the ones that are walking around all the ones that are currently hidden underneath the swamp and jump out at you they're the ones wielding the spear which we'll come on to in a minute firstly as we're talking about the scythe just look at the ash of war this is so incredibly awesome it is so badass oh my god i love it so much the weapon skill Mikola's Ring of Light has to be one of my favorite weapon skills in the game. And you can just spam it and spam it and spam it as much as you want. And it has quite a decent range on it as well, along with a hefty amount of damage. There also aren't many scythes in the game, so the fact that this is in the scythe weapon category is awesome. And it has inherent blood loss on it as well. And the one other thing to note about this is it actually has anti-block, which I didn't even know was a thing in this game. It will actually deal more damage through blocks than your average weapon, roughly 40% more, with that percentage going up with heavy and charged attacks. And now, the one I'm even more excited about, and the one that was excruciating to farm, the Clean Rot Spear. As I say, this one you can farm from all of the Clean Rot Knights that are currently lying on the ground, there is a collection of them over on the right hand side and once you've defeated Commander O'Neill you can use the site of grace where he was to just keep resting there and running south and killing a group of four of them nice and quickly. After farming for both of these weapons I ended up selling all of the duplicates from my inventory. After I had finished farming for these two weapons I ended up with so many duplicates of other items especially the armor sets. Once I'd finished acquiring these weapons, I ended up with 16 clean rot helms and also 16 clean rot armor. Add to that another seven clean rot gauntlets, followed up by 20 pairs of clean rot greaves, and finally 24 clean rot knight swords. I cannot stress how long I have been farming some of these weapons for, for the purposes of this video. If that ain't worth a like and a subscribe, I don't know what is. <laughs> and as we're talking about the spear, as you've already seen, its weapon skill, the Sacred Phalanx, 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 I don't, I've never even pronounced that word. It's probably got different pronunciations depending on where you're from. That one. That is just awesome. It does take a while for all of the holy golden spectral spears to appear out of the floor, so it's not going to be super effective against really agile enemies, but it looks so incredibly cool. Also, this spear has a special R2 that it shares only with the short spear. No other spear in the game bar these two do that awesome charged double thrust that you see. As we move into the fifth weapon on this list, the Lazuli Glintstone Sword, this one you will find in the Rhea Lucaria Academy and drops specifically from Lazuli Sorcerers that wield this sword themselves. The easiest one to farm is right by this schoolhouse classroom site of grace, which is the enemy we'll be testing the weapon out on. 
This sword is actually amazing for intelligence based builds and can be used as an alternative to the Karian Knight Sword if you are going for a pure caster build. The Garia Knight Sword will slightly outperform it if you're going for a hybrid build, however this outperforms if you're going for pure intelligence. Also, its weapon skill, the Glintstone Pebble, is awesome. It does exactly what the spell Glintstone Pebble does, but if you then follow up with an additional input, you will thrust forward with the sword, dealing a crazy amount of damage with your Glintstone infused sword. Overall, it's a neat little sword, packs a surprising punch. And it even has a very special, unique heavy attack that can block attacks before the slash comes out. And charging this heavy attack will further extend the time that the weapon blocks before you slash. Just note that despite the way it looks, it doesn't actually utilize your left hand shield during the attack. Only the block stats of this weapon apply. Which is great because it means you don't need to have a weapon equipped to use it. So it is very versatile along with being a solid fast melee option for an intellect build. Next up we're going to be taking a look at the Noble's Slender Sword that you see here and in my other hand the Noble's Estoc. Both of these swords are dropped from the Wandering Nobles in Limgrave. Obviously you'll need to kill Nobles carrying that weapon for a chance for it to drop and the drop chance for both of these is absurdly low, something stupid like 0.2 and the armor sets that go along with them are a crazy low drop chance as well. There's nothing too awesome to shout about when it comes to their move sets. One is just a very standard straight sword, and the other is a very standard thrusting sword. They can both be buffed with magic and consumables as much as you want, along with changing the infused ashes of war as well, so they are completely customizable. And the thing that does make them quite nifty is the fact that they are dipped in gold. This is not just a cosmetic effect, it means that they are one of the most expensive items in the game when it comes to selling them, both selling for a thousand runes each. And probably your best bet when trying to farm them both is this caravan here, just outside of the waypoint ruins that I was in at the start of this clip. As you can see, just like with other straight swords and thrusting swords, with the right stats and fully maxed out, they still pack a punch. And even though there's nothing specifically awesome about them when it comes to combat, they're still worth farming, even if just for a cosplay build. Next up, I will meet you at the Crumbling Beast Grave site of Grace in Faramazula. As we take a look at the Beastman's Curved Sword, and more importantly, the Beastman's Cleaver. We'll look at the Curved Sword very quickly first, because the Cleaver is the more important one. Both of them, as with all weapons in this video, have an insanely low drop rate. And without things like High Arcane, the Silver Tear Scarab, and a Silver Pickled Falfoot, it is practically impossible to get them, so do make sure you're using them items and you've got the right stats before you try and farm these. That being said, Curve Sword is a lot easier to get, purely because of how many beastmen in this area wield it. The best place specifically for this one actually is probably near the Crumbling Beast Grave site, Site of Grace, because there are seven beastmen carrying this weapon in a few rooms around that grave site. But the reason we're not going to dwell on this weapon any longer is because the Beastman's Cleaver is literally just a straight upgrade on the Curved Sword. The Curved Sword is decent if you're going for a quality build because it has strength and deck scaling but the deck scaling that it offers is fairly minor. And when you compare it to the Beastman's Cleaver, which is a curved great sword, as opposed to just being a curved sword, the Beastman's Cleaver literally just outclasses it in every single aspect. It has more damage, it has higher scaling, it breaks guards quicker, it's just so insanely good. Dual wielding these two and jump attacking with the right builds, you will obliterate everything in sight absolutely everything so now as i've been talking let me show you the two beastmen that you can farm to acquire this weapon there are four beastmen in total but the other two are miles away from each other so as you've seen as we've been talking we've gone out the bottom of that lift and we've been clearing the way of a few enemies before long once you're at the top of these stairs you can then climb up this broken pillar in front of us and head to the top of that platform there is a particularly powerful Beastman wielding the Beastman's Cleaver up there. However, the one that dropped it for me, and he is nowhere near as powerful, come back to the stairs and start heading down, and he will be just here at the bottom of the stairs. This is the guy that dropped this weapon for me. 
let me just show you the move set is freaking awesome and you will decimate anything if you choose to use this as your late game build now that i've shown off these incredibly awesome and rare weapons to you let's move on to the next one the magma blade for this one we're going to start out at the temple of eagle site of grace in volcano manor this is where you would have defeated the godskin noble from here head up the lift on your right as i show off the weapon i'm also wielding the man serpent's shield just because that's what they use but what we're focusing on is the magma blade this is a curved sword that scales with faith scaling and does inherent fire damage it is a curved sword with a blade fashioned from the lava of mount gelmir an armament of the man serpents impossible for a human to have made it deals fire damage and most importantly its unique skill the magma shower gives you the best of both worlds when combining the move set of a curved sword with the awesome weapon art of a whip as you will slash at foes in a twirling motion while scattering magma all around and an additional input allows for a follow-up attack so now head along the balcony jump down and make your way to the top of the fires of mount doom be careful of the virgin abductor that will come around the corner as you're traversing the lava run past her head through the door on your right and this is where you will find the first of the two serpents that can potentially drop this blade once you've taken him out in this next room and down the other end of this corridor is the other serpent that could potentially drop the blade there is one or two more throughout volcano manor i believe there's only one more but he is so far away from the other two that this is your best bet just grinding these two and resetting back at the temple of eagle until you hopefully get the magma blade incredibly awesome curved sword to add to your arsenal next we will move into the spiked spear of the marionettes the best place to farm this one is at the converted tower to the southwest of Lyurnia. and you basically want to look around the tower for any of the marionettes around that are wielding a spear obviously the ones using bows and arrows won't drop it so specifically there are two patrolling the slope to the north of the tower one standing to the northeast of the tower further down the slope from the previous two one patrolling the northwest and finally two more patrolling in the woods to the south as there are six enemies all quite close by you shouldn't have many problems getting this one having two of them means that you can truly role play as a marionette however unlike when wielded by the marionettes you unfortunately can't start flailing them around you at a million percent speed like they do but it's still a cool weapon to have and this spear does have a rare horizontal r2 which is shared only with the partisan and the death ritual spear but when you do dual wield spears their power stanced moves are very very awesome also it does have inherent blood loss build up and can be infused with any ash of war and buffed with any magic or consumables now let's move on to the ripple crescent halberd of the elbanorix for this one we're going to start off at the palace approach ledge road site of grace that i'm sure many 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 of us cheesy farmers are very familiar with this weapon cannot be infused with different ashes of war however what makes this an incredibly powerful sleeper weapon is the fact that it can be buffed with magic and consumables and is one of the very few arcane scaling weapons that can along with having an s scaling before it is even fully maxed out this means that it will significantly increase status effect builder as well as damage which means this is ideal melee arcane builds and using a lot of greases for certain greases such as the drawstring poison grease it will nearly double the effectiveness of that grease so this can be an incredibly powerful weapon when in the right hands and used with the right build now for where to get it just keep heading all the way down the hill and at the bottom when you get to the blood swamps you will see no less than nine albanorix just patrolling around a couple of trees all wielding this weapon and as you can see this one i somehow very luckily managed to get a second one almost instantly hopefully you get that lucky and this grind isn't too bad for you but don't hold your breath just in case and we will now move into the final of the 16 rarest weapons in elden ring the monk's flame mace and then way more importantly the monk's flame blade 
Both of these weapons are technically as rare as each other. However, you may find that you actually already have the Monk's Flame Mace just from a regular playthrough. There's a bunch of them wielding it in Lyurnia and in the mountaintops of the Giants, and even more monks wielding this weapon are patrolling around the Guardian's garrison as well. It also has a very unique R2. As you can see, the strong attack rouses a fiery combative spirit and looks a bit stupid, if I'm entirely honest. But the main reason we are checking out the monk's weapons is because of the monk's flame blade. This can literally only drop from one enemy in the entire game. Now, as for where to get it, from the Sight of Grace, go down the stairs to your left. You can avoid the first Fire Monk completely if you want, and then go right through the hidden path, jump down, avoiding or killing the imps, and then proceed forward. Here, you can use Margit's Shackle to turn off the Flame Trap. And as you head down this hallway, the only monk in the game wielding this weapon will ambush you from the corridor off to your right. This is a painful farm as he is the only enemy in the game that drops this weapon, so good luck. And I am absolutely devastated that it is not more badass. It can be infused with Ashes of War, so it doesn't just need to have the spinning slash that quite a few weapons have. But apart from that, there is nothing that cool about it. It looks absolutely amazing, don't get me wrong. But surely this should have innate fire damage. Why would it not? It's called the Flame Blade. It's a curved sword with a flickering flame motif. It's wielded by fire monks <laughs> who came to the land of Leonia in pursuit of a fugitive who stole their fire. There physically could be no more references to fire on this weapon, yet it doesn't deal any fire damage. It is unfortunately very generic. But as you can equip different Ashes of War on it, equip something like the Flames of the Red Mane or Flaming Strike. As we're wrapping up this video, did you know that I have a second YouTube channel where I upload all of the challenge runs that I live stream over on Twitch? So if watching live content isn't really your thing but you don't want to miss out, the link to that channel is down in the description. And whilst you're over there, please hit subscribe, I'd be very grateful. And with that, all that's left for me to say is as always, thank you so much for watching. I hope you have an amazing day, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.